This is Plan B, Episode 18, for August 6th, 2013. And welcome to Plan B, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show contemplating the future and present of Bitcoin with insights for the novice shop talk for the expert and opinionated discussion for the interested observer of Bitcoin and related technologies. My name is Chris and joining me every single week is my co-host, Drew. Well, hello there, Mr. Drew. Well, hello. Hello there. Welcome to episode 18, sir. Oh, yeah, thanks. We have a fun show today. Uh, I'm uh, enjoying the nice weather. Again, it's summertime here in the Pacific Northwest, recovering from having the third child and excited to once again document another week in the evolving story that is cryptocurrencies, Drew. Oh, oh no, yeah. I know. Bring now, uh, how are you doing temperature-wise in your neck of the woods over there? Uh, a mere 91 degrees, no fans, no okay. air, okay. no fans on currently, no AC. Um, I'm just uh, getting uh, restuck to my chair. We should be good in a couple <laughs> minutes here. I'm hoping maybe we can uh, maybe we can distract you from the temperatures. So coming up in just a little bit, Adam B. Levine from the Let's Talk Bitcoin podcast will join us. He's a pretty smart guy, and he's been ta- he's been thinking a lot about the future of independent content monetization. One of my favorite topics, as some of you might out there would not be too surprised to learn. So uh, I'm glad he's been thinking about this, and he's got a big update. He's going to call in and chat with us. We're also, uh, after a little bit into the show, we're going to open up the lines and just take calls from folks who uh, have comments on any of the stories we're covering today or have anything they want to address on the show. It's going to be an open mic session. And we've also got some great discussion pieces. But first, Drew, we should feedback. start with our feedback. Yep. Oh, yeah. So as per is tradition, per tradition, easy for me to say on the Plan B show, uh, we'd like to take your emails at plan B at jupiterbroadcasting.com. And Jonathan wrote in, he said, I'm interested in getting some skin in the game. In Bitcoin and Litecoin, that is. I don't have a lot of cash, but I heard you mention on Plan B that you don't have to buy a whole Bitcoin. That's awesome, and I didn't know that. Okay, what I'm wanting to know is, what exchange do you recommend using to buy Bitcoin and Litecoin? I just found the show Plan B and have listened to the newest episode, as well as the episode on mining. I think that was episode five. Thanks for the great work. I love Jupiter Broadcasting and regularly listen to the Unfilter Show, which I am a supporter of. Plan B, the Linux Action Show, and TechSnap. You guys rock. Interesting, Drew. He wants to get into the uh, Bitcoin game, and he wants to just buy in little bits at a time. Nice little bits. Yeah, you can buy you know very, very small fractions if you want. Um, I bought 1.5 a couple last week, I think, on both of our favorite uh, Bitcoin uh, exchanges, which is Coinbase. Coinbase. Oh, okay. Okay. So you're thinking you should go the Coinbase route. Oh, yeah. Um, well, much easier. Uh, I, I can't imagine going to Camp BX, dealing with any of that stuff, any of the registration stuff. I used Mt. Gox back in 2011, back in the day, through Douala. I don't ever want to do that again. Uh, it's, just, it's just awesome. You just link your yeah. bank account and there you go. You know, And now you can, now you can get your Bitcoins ultra fast. You do have a little, there's a little transaction fee there, right? Um, and yeah. the, it, which might, you know, I've, I don't know. I'm only, I usually buy in whole coins myself, and I think that's sort of just a mental thing that I have about it. Right. Yeah. Same here. And I almost wonder if you're doing, if you had some over the counter type trading, you could do. You might be able to get away at a lower rate when you're buying smaller amounts. Um, I don't know. I say, I say, uh, I say, Coinbase is a great way to get started if you're really new to Bitcoin because it's the least likely path that's going to burn you. Right. That's it's it's definitely the safest noob friendly path. Definitely, yeah. And if it's very, your first Bitcoin, why not go? Why not go the safe route somewhere you can trust, and then do a little research. You know, invest a little more time and energy once you actually have that Bitcoin and you've got something you're actually invested in. And once you get used to how it works, maybe check out local Bitcoins to see if you can get any good deals locally. Yeah, yeah, we've got uh, we covered that in a previous episode. All right, good email, Jonathan. Thank you. Ron writes in. He says, "Hi guys, I routinely listen to Plan B show, and I like it. and I learn quite a bit. I wanted to let you know about something else as well." There is a policy change at Camp BX you might want to warn your listeners about. In the past, when you deposit BTC to Camp BX, you could generate a new address to send to each, each time. But you also had the option of reusing the old addresses. I've made several deposits to Camp BX using the same BTC address in the past. However, they have now gone to a policy of expiring each BTC deposit address after a week. I didn't know that, and I sent some BTC to the old address. Oh, those BTCs Uh-oh. are now in limbo. 
and I don't know if I'll be able to get the deposit address every time at Camp BX, or if they must verify that old address is still valid. Their fax is you can get such funds back, but they charge you s- several hours of labor what? to do it. Sincerely, what? Ron. Oh, that's that's interesting uh, customer service there. But I mean, they they should probably put a gigantic warning to not reuse this address in the future, the one they used to deposit into Camp BX. I wonder why they would do that. It's weird that they would rotate it in like once a week. You know, you think they might do it per transaction or something like that, but it's I, strange that they would just choose once a week. I like uh, Camp BX's new uh, business model they got here, where uh, they set up the uh, trading platform, but the monetization strategy is actually in charging you for any trouble you ever have with that trading platform. Right? That's that's what? where they're going to make their money because he says they charge him for hours of labor. Hours of labor to receive yeah. or to retrieve bitcoins that are sent to an address that they possess. Uh, Hours of labor for that, huh? It's, uh, you know, it's one of those things where uh, everybody's got to make a buck, Drew. <laughs> I get the model, but I think that's something that you have to just work into your, your bottom line. You know, not, yeah. <laughs> that's a little going a little bit too far into the individualized uh, little aspect. I guess they get to claim user error, even though it's their <laughs> kind of complicated system that introduced the user error. And you got to be very explicit when they're, when they're making these changes. It doesn't, I, I don't use CampBX, but it doesn't sound like they were, they sent you an email going, hey, this is how we're doing it, or a big band or anything like that. It doesn't sound like they did that. Of course, the, fl- the flip side is maybe if they're charging, they can get some really good support people. Yeah, that's true. They, you they know, have, to, might have great support for the amount that you're paying. Yeah, and then maybe they could, you know, kind of like uh, early on in the game of cloud computing, before it was even called cloud computing, uh, Rackspace built themselves a name. Uh, for being fanatical support. They had Rack rack Space has fanatical support. Yeah, they're a little more expensive, but they have fanatical support. I mean, people will robotically parrot that when you mention Rack Space, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, they got fanatical support. And they charge a premium price. And you got to wonder if there's people out there, like we just talked about Jonathan, he's just getting into Bitcoin, okay? And he's not exactly sure the safest route to go. Sure, okay, I, I understand that too. And if he hears there's this one exchange where if you have an accident, if you have a boo-boo, yeah, you got to pay him a little money, but they're going to take care of you. Actually, that might actually sell. Yeah, but I think that would be implied, you know, with other exchanges as well, that they're going to help you out anyway. But I mean, I, they are, I, other, I, I guess CampVX seems to be trying to differentiate themselves and, 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 you know, what kind of services they provide for their support relative to, uh, you know, other exchanges. I don't, I don't know if MT, or Mt. Gox or, you know, any other exchanges doing this kind of thing. Yeah, I, 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 you know, uh, Gox, uh, Gox has been pretty quiet recently. Although they just uh, they released that little press release that they yeah. said we're 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 gonna we're gonna do stuff in the uh, in the yeah. future. Yeah, <laughs> we're gonna fix stuff uh, <laughs> at, at some point in time here pretty soon. I wonder if so, they got the same uh, PR people that Butterfly Labs does because Gox <laughs> is like, yeah, hey, hey guys, like this is like a month ago, right? They're like, hey guys, we're working on a new trading engine and uh, Litecoin two FTW. Talk to you soon. We got it in two weeks, man. And then like a month goes by. And then, like, uh, on Monday, I think it was, Gox puts out a press release. And not many places actually even picked it up. GigaOM, surprisingly, was one of them. GigaOM has been upping their Bitcoin coverage recently, I've noticed. And uh, they cut, they ran the Gox press release. And when you read through it, it's essentially, yeah, we're going to announce something in a few days. And they kind of gave a little more details. Gox said they're going to move the trading platform from a, from a host oh, that's right. to something internally. I guess they've had it on some third-party system, which was probably... A more reliable infrastructure. So I mean, uh, now they're going to bring it into self-hosted servers. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, I guess it's good from a security perspective, but I don't know about the uh, yeah, like what you just said. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't even know if it's good from a security perspective. I actually because yeah, like yeah. now not gonna, not that you know, EC2 or Rackspace is going to be flawless, but at least their job is to keep it secure, right? Yeah, that is. They have a great deal of incentive doing that. So yeah, <laughs> I don't know about Mount Gox's uh, receptiveness to their own incentives. I don't know, man. <laughs> I mean, I don't know why I'm so skeptical. So far, Gox has really rocked it. So I, I don't really. Maybe I should. Uh, I, I can't think of a single fault they've had recently, right? Yeah, I mean, Gox has just been, been okay. oh aces, aces. Uh, all right. Well, uh, one uh, last bit of feedback before we get to our voicemail this week. Um, this one came in on our subreddit from uh, Player Deuce. He says, "I've not finished watching your show." I don't know if you talked about this later, but deflation doesn't cause people to save their money. It causes them to spend it. Deflation is is experienced as a price drop. And he goes on to say, uh, they are one and the same. Lower prices appeal to people to sp- uh, appeal to people to spend their money. A currency that both inflates and deflates, people will want to save when inflation occurs and spend when deflation occurs. A currency that consistently inflates causes people to want to buy assets that will protect their wealth from that inflation, such as gold, bitcoins, real estate. Etc. Just like we are seeing happen in our own economy now. 
Uh, I, that's my uh, addition. So as inflationary currency doesn't necessarily create jobs or help the economy by making people spend. Right. It, great point. And uh, did we did we not touch on that last week? Uh, I, you know, I'm really tired, but I'm pretty sure we didn't. <laughs> so this but, was this was I think this that was my bad because that was the core of what I yeah, was right. trying to get across last week is I've already experienced this in Bitcoin myself. I, I as somebody who is using some of my weekly living, I'm using Bitcoin for some of my li- weekly living. You know, I should do a Kickstarter and do a video about this. I can make millions. But I really am. I buy food. I buy goods. I buy crap that I probably shouldn't spend Bitcoin on with Bitcoins just just to, just to do that, to, to, to talk about it here on the show to you guys and to live that and experience that and to help that economy. And I'll tell you, there are times where I am more likely to spend and there are times when I'm more likely to save. Um, but I definitely dig what he's saying about how you see like people bailing into real estate or bailing into gold or even Bitcoin when they're worried about uh, – Inflation in, in fiat currency. And there, there's quite a lively discussion in here. If anybody wants to uh, read about a bunch of economic arguments, there's about 15 comments in here, the most I think we've ever had. So if you want to check it out, subreddit check is great. Out. Subreddit, you know, subreddit is great for that. And it was, we're, you know, we're still playing with that format because there's a really great, there's already tons of great Bitcoin subreddits, right? So we, the role of our subreddit is not necessarily to be breaking news, but to sort of correlate content and, 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 and discussion for the show. And this week was great for that. So thanks to you guys. Planbshow.reddit.com if you want to join them. All right, Drew, should we play our voicemail for this week? Yes, sir. And he didn't even leave us her name. It's it, or his name. It's Anonymous. Hey, when all this talk about Bitcoin and inflation, I'm kind of wondering, is the economy slowing down really a problem? Here's, here's what I'm thinking. The purpose of the economy is to provide people with the goods and services they need to be comfortable and to live. And the input to that process is human labor. So if we take less human labor to produce the same goods and services, the economy is actually running more efficiently. So the goal isn't full employment. The goal is full unemployment, where everybody has what they need but doesn't have to work too hard to get it. So deflation really would be a sign of that, right? If money, like Bitcoin, is a proxy for human labor, then the fact that goods and services cost less means that we're getting more goods and services for the same amount of input, the same amount of human labor. So really, a slowing economy and deflation is actually a sign that we're becoming more efficient and that we're getting more bang for our buck, so to speak. So, thanks for the show. Bye. Yeah, you know, exactly. And that's a great follow-up to, uh, to uh, Player Deuce's uh, comment in our subreddit. Uh, it could potentially be a sign of a more efficient economy because as a buyer, I get more for my dollar mm-hmm. or my coin or my coin. Oh. Yep. All right. Uh, well, thank you, Anonymous, for leaving us that voicemail. If you'd like to leave us a voicemail, you can call us 1-352-587-5262. That's one three fifty two fifty eight 58 plan b Leave us a voicemail and we'll play it in next week's show. We're going to open up the lines in a little bit and just take some good old classic calls. Uh, but first, Drew, before we get to the discussion, uh, I want to bring on Adam B. Levine from the Let's Talk Bitcoin podcast. Uh, not only is he uh, not only is he one of the hosts of the fantastic Let's Talk Bitcoin podcast, but he's been somebody who's been uh, I, I have watched the discussion around funding independent media for a long time. And some of the best ideas I've seen in a long time have come from this man's brain. So, Adam, welcome to the show. Well, that's a flattering introduction. Thank you very much, Chris. Thanks for having me on the show. <laughs> well, it happens to be one of my favorite topics because I feel like uh, there's so many aspects to new media that are just such a slam dunk in terms of its you know, on-demand nature, community involvement. Uh, it's sort of a complete reboot of the structure where you have the corporate media that is driven by these monstrous advertisement contracts. It's a total wash away of all of that. But the thing we really haven't cracked is how to percolate the good content up and let it get funding and i think this is if we can if we can nail this down then we really can begin to mount a challenge against this industrial media complex i think that you are about as right as you could possibly be so for me it's all about the incentives right if the incentives are clean and the incentives point us in the right direction then we will if if the incentives incentivize good outcomes and in this case good quality content then we'll get good quality content. You'll get less of the garbage that you normally get. Let, let's talk about the, the media model for a second. The standard media model that we've kind of worked with from everything from smoke signals to radio to newspapers to network television is this is sort of like a square, right? Where the advertiser pays the platform, which is either the website or the TV station or what have you. The platform pays the content creator and the content creator provides value, pr- creates content and provides value to the audience. But then 
the audience doesn't have a way to provide feedback back to the content creator. So you have like this, this weird game of telephone where the content creator has a direct connection to the audience, but it doesn't go the other way. And in fact, you have several, several intermediaries getting in the way of that communication that really have nothing to do with the content. Mm -hmm. So what we can do with cryptocurrencies is we can take that square and we can separate it into two basically circles, right? Where, where the audience pays for the content and the content creators create content directly for the audience. And that's a very clean feedback loop right there. And then on the other side, you've got the platform, which is either the website or the TV station, whatever, whatever you want. And it's paid for by the advertiser or by the sponsor. And so one of them, you know, the advertiser or the sponsor uh, platform side cares only about the meta concept, right? They only care about how much traffic is going in overall, how many uh, views there are, stuff like that. Whereas the audience and the content creator, they care about every single piece of content that comes out. You're advertisers don't necessarily care what you say on each individual show, but your audience sure does. The right, advertisers right. just want to know. Exactly. So, 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 so if you can set it up like this, then what you can do is you can take, you can have it so that the, the content side of the equation provides activity for the platform and gives it purpose for the platform. And the, the platform side provides infrastructure and, and context for the content. So I'm going to back up a sec because because there's a little bit we got to get to first. And there's a lot of ground to cover here, and I want to do it quick so we can talk about other things. Okay, um, so you've probably never heard of a website called Cointagion.com, but I'd like you to visit it right now. Okay. C-O-I-N-T-A-G-I-O-N. Okay, so like Contagion, but coin. So it's a really purple website. And uh, the guy who created it, his name is Dr. Conrad Barsky. And really what it is, is it's like a catalog. It's like, you know, it's like kind of like a catalog on the web. It doesn't look like much to start, but it, they do something really, really cool that I, that I think is very important here and is important for, for us moving forward. What they do is that every time someone visits the web page, they generate a new Bitcoin payment address for every item for every person. Okay, that's really different than how we do things now. If you use BitPay or something like that, then it's basically the same old shopping cart experience you've always had. It's just that at the end of it, instead of putting in your credit card information, you pay with Bitcoin. So yeah, it simplifies yeah. a little bit, but not very much. Yeah. What you can do with this is you can make it so you don't have to have user accounts. You can make it so you don't have to have any sort of any sort of identity whatsoever associated with this because that address only connects to your identity. And in this case, your identity, they determine identity through IP addresses or a browser cookie. But so, so you can take that and then you can apply it to all of these other things. And it makes them really, really interesting. So you take that and you apply it to the concept of tipping. And suddenly you can have, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's uh, attributable. That's what it is. Attributable mm -hmm. where you can like, you can say, okay, this person tipped this time and this time and this time without them ever having an account. You can say, uh -huh. you can, you can go to advertising, right? You can take display advertising. You, you look at display advertising and one of the things you'll notice about it is that it doesn't really belong on the internet. A display advertisement is kind of close to a billboard on the side of the road. It might look attractive. It might tell you how to get you know, to the store that you're trying to go to. But ultimately, if you try to hand it a couple of dollar bills to buy the thing that it's trying to sell you, it can't actually help you there. But if you take this concept of one address per use per user and you apply it to display advertising, then suddenly every 2D billboard becomes a rich 3D uh, like vending machine that you you send the correct amount of money to it and then you basically reach in and and grab it out grab out whatever it is that you're trying to get be it physical or digital and you can if it's digital it can start downloading in the background on your browser with nothing with with no clicks whatsoever from you if it's physical if you have an address on file again you have to have an account for this to work but if you have an address on file it can be automatically shipped to you this is sort so, of taking like that app instant instantaneous purchase model and bringing it to just purchasing almost anything then to anything, to anything. But then, I mean, you, you can, t you can take this even further than that. What is an advertisement, right? If, if an, if an advertisement is not a, a billboard, then you can treat it almost like shelf space. And if it's shelf space, you can put all kinds of things into that shelf. So you could do like a Kickstarter crowdfunding style uh, campaign where it just, instead of going to Kickstarter and getting lost amongst the thousands of various projects that are there now, because I mean, again, it used to be something special that you would go to crowdfunding, but now these sites have gotten to be massive and it's very difficult to stand out even from the other people who are trying to crowdfund. Mm -hmm. But you can take this, you can find the, the particular website or community or niche or multiples. And in 
instead of making this deal where you give 8% to Am- to uh, to Kickstarter in order to you know get lost on their site, you can set it up so that they could have a Kickstarter campaign right on Plan B's website. And when people mouse over it, it pops it up and it shows you all of the different reward tiers and how and the address t- uh, to send it to and however much you send it. You know, again, it's easy to to uh, to attribute these things, these payments to whoever it is, regardless of if you have an account or not. Hmm. So what I've been focused on for the last, I don't know, I guess about three weeks now, you know, this has been a focus for me for the last couple of months, but in the last three weeks, it's just sort of started to to come together into mm-hmm. this platform that I'm calling Watershed. And uh, that's that's a code name. It's going to be something else when, when we figure it out. Well, I like Patreon. Watershed, though. That's good. I know. I like it, too. But but the problem <laughs> is, is it's a little bit of a forced metaphor <laughs> because if you play it out, it doesn't work quite as well oh, okay, as I'd like it yeah. to. But the point is, is that is that if we is that uh, what we're going to build is a platform from the ground up to leverage cryptocurrencies and to leverage this idea of one address per use per user and to create community that that instead of relying on sponsors it it still has sponsors again to cover the platform side but for the content side it's very very clean and also we're talking about this concept called tips and untips tips are you know you because okay again there's so much here it's it's difficult to to phrase oh, yeah. it oh yeah uh so the thing about tips is that if someone disagrees with you, they're not going to tip you. That is different from you putting out low quality work or putting out work that does not have value. To <laughs> right, right. Right. So, so this is the problem is that like on, on Reddit, you go on Reddit and a lot of times if something is just unpopular that people don't agree with, but it you know might be a, just a, a fact, it's, you can a lot of times still see it gets crazy downvoted because yeah, yeah. in a culture of free content, it's, it's more just like, do you agree with this or not? Not right. do I get value it's from this. It's an emotional so thing almost on Reddit. <laughs> that's totally true. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and, and so that's what this concept of tips versus untips, both of them imbue the opinion with value. It doesn't matter how much value. It can be 0.0001 one Bitcoin, it still is value that someone has taken the time, they actually care enough to do it. And so an untip, uh, so a tip goes to the the creator of the content, but an untip doesn't have to go to the creator of a content. It can go flat, uh, frankly, somewhere else. You know, it could go to a charity that's relative to it. It could Mm. go, you know, in ideologically diverse communities, you could see uh, having untips go to simply the the guys who write oppositional content about whatever it is that you're disagreeing with because they are literally the other side of the argument. But either way it goes, it gets rid of this trolling phenomena where you have people who don't even listen to what it is that you're doing, don't even care about what you're saying. They're just in a bad mood walking by, you know, and they see a headline they don't like. Mm-hmm. And so they can still certainly have an impact, but it provides an additional level above that sort of that sort of I don't really care about this, but I still have an opinion because I have an opinion about everything sort of thing. I, I really love the uh, the this you send money to this address and you've bought it. The, the automation possibility that are, there is is huge. Now I bring it back to my my thought is around replacing a lot of the traditional systems we have now. And I always go to media because one of the things that I like about what you're saying is. You have, you still have it. There's a platform. Perhaps it's a podcasting network, or perhaps it's YouTube, and they still have ads to pay their costs. But that system doesn't really work for the content creators, and it doesn't encourage good content. In fact, it's it, it encourages the opposite. It encourages gamification of YouTube to earn the highest revenue, which promotes bad content. And yes. when you when you kind of enable a system <clears throat> that and Bitcoin gets a big part of the way there, but it's still too complicated. It's still there's still too much work involved to actually make the payment. But if you smooth that out. It allows the audience to say, I liked this episode. I'm going to contribute X amount of money. It, and what it does is it rewards that creator for creating the content that the audience loves and not the content that the advertiser wants to be able to put their brand on. And I think that's a huge – and as the content gets to a wider and wider audience, as you get to the larger networks like your Rev3 – and your twits, if that starts to become more of a big deal, and then when you get into TV, it's the it's the dominant it's the dominant um, uh, editorial driver. And so this has the ramifications of just of just smoothing this out, sort of knock down all of these walls that then all of a sudden can pr- promote this revolutionary change in the quality of information that people are receiving. I mean, it's a huge and deal. I, I totally agree. And beyond even that part of it, there there is another part. From the pl- okay, so from the content creator's perspective, this is good because it it means that you're essentially being paid based on merit. But on the platform side, it actually is incredibly empowering because instead of having to pay the content creator, right. you completely outsource that to the audience. You invest so, in the platform. 
Exactly. So you you entirely focus on the platform and almost become a curator of content creators more so than you are a curator of content. Because if you're not paying the content creators and you run like a podcast network, there is no disadvantage to having as many people in your network as possible who are producing high quality work. Right. Yeah. Because you don't pay them. Right. So, so it means that that sites that are good at 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 finding and helping this content be, be come into existence will be sites that instead of being like incredibly selective will be sites that will have a huge amount of content from a diverse range of opinions because ultimately it's just a question of what the audience values. So we're getting ready to launch, to relaunch Let's Talk Bitcoin a week from tomorrow uh, on Wednesday the 10th of August um, to, uh, to essentially incorporate this idea because right now we do a twice weekly show. You guys don't really have this problem because you do so many shows, but we only do our show twice a week. And so there's not too much incentive for people to ever visit our website. Mm -hmm. So by using this, by using this sort of, uh, this sort of model, what we're going to do is we're going to have about 25 writers who are writing for us on like a monthly basis. And there's no disadvantage to us doing this. So we can put out a, an original, a piece of original content with no cost on the platform whatsoever. And so that makes it more valuable for us because we'll get more listeners who are attracted by the other content besides the show. It's more attractive for creators because they're bringing their audience with them, but then so is everybody else. And it's more attractive for the platform because if you're a daily platform that's providing content on a daily basis at a high level, that's a site that people visit every day as opposed to a site, even if you're producing content maybe you know a couple of times a week, it still is much harder to become a daily part of people's habits if you're not on a daily release schedule. And it's very difficult to do that without cost. You insulate the platform from the risk of going off in a direction of an investment in something that doesn't pay off and then the platform could potentially be bankrupt. <laughs> that, you know, exactly. It, it also yeah, eliminates thing, a huge the risk. Incentives. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it really the incentives are just so clear. I like right. that a lot. So you guys are gonna take you guys are gonna kinda take a lot of these a lot of these concepts and put them into practice over there. Yeah, so that's the goal. I'm finishing up. I was really hoping, you know, I talked about this at the Inside Bitcoins conference. This is what I gave my talk on. Yeah, which um, you just got back from recently, right? Yeah, yeah, we just uh, got back. Uh, I guess it was four days ago. I'm, you know, still, <laughs> I'm still recovering yeah. a little bit, but uh, but it was a lot of fun. That was, you know, I mean, Chris, you got to start going to these events, man. No, the, uh, I think it's the, gonna be. I think it's gonna be soon. I had to get. I had to get done having all the kids. You see. I understand. Hey, congratulations <laughs> on that. I heard Thanks. about that. Yeah, I know the timing worked out so that I couldn't go to some of these conferences. But you know what? That's the hit I have to take for this year. Ah, uh, well, uh, you know. Good, good on you. But next year, next year, I think everybody will be, I think all the kids will be enough, you know, like old enough that I can leave mom for a while. She can manage the fort while I'm gone and the, and the place won't fall apart. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. <laughs> cool. Well, um, yeah. So, so basically, yeah, that, that's it. We're, we're trying to, you know, we're going to pioneer these models. I don't know if I mentioned this, the platform that we're creating is going to be free open source software too. Mm. So, uh, so the, the, the goal here is not to turn this into something that I'm able to monetize personally. The goal is to pro provide a platform that anybody can plug their content into and utilize this virtuous cycle of daily content that's high quality in whatever the particular niche you're in, you know, attracting more attention, making it easier for you to find, growing your audience, and to, to essentially leverage this virtuous cycle to allow any community to boost their way to prominence just by using cryptocurrencies as the power behind it all. Open source currency with an open source payment platform. It's powerful stuff, man. It's powerful stuff. I hope it takes off. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have to keep in touch on that and see how it goes. Absolutely. I think, be, I think it could be really good for the internet in general. Adam, do you want to... Uh, Stick around for a bit and do some of the uh, discussion with us and maybe take some hey, live I'm, calls. Sure. Absolutely. All right, chat room. Well, you know what? There you go. We'll open up the lines if you guys want to call. And if you, uh, have, a, if you have any follow-up questions with anything that uh, Adam just touched on, or if you have any ideas or suggestions, or if you have any input on any of the topics we're going to cover today, feel free to Skype us at Jupiter Broadcasting, just on Skype, or give us a call, 1-360-322-4801. All right. So uh, moving on now, I wanted to uh, one thing. I don't know if uh, Drew, if you caught this story, and Adam, I don't know if you caught this story this week, but uh, on Monday or Tuesday, it broke that uh, private investor, big private investor, uh, he, uh, Joe Lewis, would be backing Avalon via a funding a venture called uh, I think it was like uh, Phoenix Funds funding or something like that. Did you guys catch this story? I, I believe I did. Yeah, uh, I don't know if it's a different uh, different. Uh a group, but uh, I heard something about it. Well, so it got it got ran by the Wall Street Journal. It was uh, it was on a lot of sites. Um, it turns out it was actually a bit of a, a mix up, and, <laughs> and you gotta wonder when something's this big of a mix up if maybe there wasn't some some gaming going on here. Uh, 
Uh, when contacted, Lewis said, I have no investments whatsoever in any Bitcoin ventures. Um, they went on to say, after contacting his spokesperson, this is uh, posted with the Wall Street Journal in their retraction, investor Joe Lewis isn't investing in a Bitcoin venture called Avalon and doesn't have a lead Zunich Zunich-based private equity fund called Phoenix Fund. An article on the supposed investment was inaccurately published and has been removed. Comments posted in response to an erroneous article have also been removed from the Wall Street Journal's website. And you kind of track this line of sequence of events back, and there is a company out there that has been involved in funding back in 2011 or something like that called Avalon. They were taking on some VC funding from somebody called Phoenix, but it doesn't look like any of it's actually related to the Avalon we all know and love, and none of it was related to Bitcoin in any way whatsoever. So uh, we actually got this leak, too, uh, on Thursday of last week. <laughs> so do you so, think this was planted? Uh, you know, it's a this particular one is hard to determine Bit because, of an error, right? Well, OK, so so here's the deal. Um, the, the leaker who contacted us was very concerned about this and very, very sure that this was happening and was, you know, at least claimed to be fairly highly placed. I pressed him for a while. We wound up not reporting on it because I couldn't verify it through a secondary source. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to mention this deal. You know, I mean, another reason why we didn't cover it is that the deal was supposed to go through today. So if you have a super secret deal that you don't want anybody to know about and the day before you're going to do it, it shows up in the Wall Street. What do you do? Yeah, <laughs> you, 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 you say to everybody who's involved with that deal, you guys can't keep a secret. You bunch of amateurs. Screw you. And, you know, you walk away. So so I don't know. I mean, it oh, might have been real. Take. Yeah. I, hmm. I, I mean, again, it's the play. People are getting all concerned about the, the, the size of this investment because the rumor, of course, is that it's a two hundred million dollar buy in. Yeah. Exactly. And at the current valuations, that might not make sense. But in a year from now, I think that's going to be chump change. And yeah, I think the buying if, for the future, it maybe it's not so crazy. Exactly, exactly. Because I mean, because what they were trying to do, you know, again, this is, it could all be an elaborate hoax. And I'll believe that they basically shopped the rumor until they found, and they shopped the leak until they found somebody who would cover it. It did seem like um, that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that certainly is what happened. You know, I went back and forth with, with the guy a number of times, and we have some more information that wasn't released, some, uh, some additional names. But, you know, again, it's, it's, the question is, does it really matter? Does this matter? I think that this is the direction that ASICs are going in regardless. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's it just is what has to happen. If it's a zero sum game, which means that if, if I win, somebody else loses, then that means that if I can jump two generations ahead of the competition, that's an enormous win. It doesn't matter what that costs me, especially if I think that. Don't uh, you think Bitcoin that's what $200 million dollars would mean? To oh, a company like Avalon that they would. They Absolutely. Would, yeah. And yeah. Uh, that would not See, necessarily be a good thing for Bitcoin. Well, again, it, it depends on – there are different sides of this argument. I tend to agree. I think that ASICs are driving centralization just because – you know. but it, there's a difference between ASIC distribution, which is to say how many people are operating ASIC units versus ASIC manufacturing. There, there is a differentiation yeah, yeah, there. Yeah. So what this would do is it would drive companies like Butterfly Labs, companies like KNC. It would put a lot of hurt on them because they've invested large amounts of customer money into equipment that will functionally be invalidated if something like this were to actually happen. Right. I mean, think about how many people's, uh, how many companies that are forming right now to really focus in on this as their business would really be, I mean, this would be a massive blow. And when you think about it, it, it kind of seems like even if this story was smoke, this probably will happen yeah. Within maybe even this year. Yeah. And, and that's the other thing is that at this event, I spoke with the guy from KNC Miner and two other ASIC manufacturers who were there. And their whole thing, you know, because uh, I don't know if you heard one of our recent episodes, um, KNC has been talking about having like uh, like a release schedule where they coordinate with all of the other uh, ASIC manufacturers so that they release for three months and then they don't release for three months. Because otherwise, the technology is moving so fast that people who buy their ASICs aren't aren't being able to make back their investment and probably never will simply because they're right. they're you know it's moving so fast they're being invalidated so what they were happy about that you know they they were saying yes we're going to do this it's fine and everybody who I talked to there was like yeah that sounds like a good idea to me not not normal people but the people who are doing these manufacturing projects uh, so so they're they're happy about it but they're happy about it because it's raising the cost to entry Right. It's uh, so they're saying that the problem is there are too many ASIC manufacturers. And, mm. and so what we have to do is we have to show people that there's no more room in ASICs. And so, of course, what's what Avalon is supposedly doing is just an expansion of that. It's just taking that same game. And instead of saying, OK, well, we're happy with the five ASIC manufacturers there are now. It's, it's them saying, OK, well, we'd rather it just be us. I mean, it's the same thing, just at a different level. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I, uh, I'm going to sit back and uh, just wait for my Butterfly Labs hardware to never arrive. It's cool never. though. It's cool. I'm What's probably your pre-order the, number? I'm probably the. I don't even. I, I don't even obsess. I don't even know. I, I got. <laughs> I got in towards um, mid-April of this year, so I'm not very. I'm not like in the early, but I'm not like all the way at the very end. Uh, I got it. You know, I'm probably the only guy that bought it specifically because I didn't think they'd be able to deliver. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, because you know, I thought I'm going to live this pain on the show, and I'll just live it. And when I get it, I'll talk about it, and if whatever happens, happens. And if I get to mine for months, then I do. And of course, then uh, Drew ends up pulling the trigger on the block eruptor. Seems like it was a much better direction to go. Uh, I don't know about that. There, I mean, <laughs> Drew, are you going to make it back? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at uh, I'm at point three five. <laughs> After uh, dropping three bitcoins on him, so we'll, we'll see. So, I mean, so what do you guys think is the future for mining? I mean, like, will you be buying more mining equipment in the next, say, year, or has this experience been painful enough that you're probably going to sit out? I, I I don't know. Hmm, what do you think, Drew? The only way that I could see it is is if if I could see what the difficulty will be and what the cost of the hardware is when it's readily readily available to everybody, not just to uh, specific people who pre-order. Like I would I would want to see what the profitability would be if these things are available to basically everybody. You know, within like you know you can get it within a week if it can be profitable in that time, and then you can you can get you know better projections because right now it's kind of hard to project what the difficulty is going to be because we don't, you know, we're not really sure about the number of ASICs that are currently being used. I but. think also the hard thing to kind of consider is what will the price of Bitcoin be in 10 years, right? Because that, does that change it? So it is, if Drew mines 0.3 Bitcoins, but maybe those 0.3 Bitcoins are worth $500 in five years, that might be a different great, story that, too, that's, right? That's a, that's a little too far in the future for, for most people to feel oh, yeah. comfortable. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and the other thing that's kind of unfortunate is these won't necessarily be – you can't reutilize these to work on another cryptocurrency as it kind of comes up. So you're kind of stuck there. Maybe there'll be something else that comes along. I think, I think you know, there's a lot of people who will buy just because they want to they take part in the network. I think there is like a lot of people who run SETI and folding at home. There's, a, there's people who will just have a miner, I hope. Um, I wonder if in, down the road, if we won't even be talking about mining so much in the sense of mining hardware but more like just more standardized buying shares of mining companies or or you know trading that kind of thing like a max kaiser virtual trading platform for mining companies where we're buying and selling in different companies as they develop new technology oh man avalon just got a 200 million dollar investment i'm going to buy 30 shares of their mining results and maybe there'll be some sort of mount gox type trading platform to to do all of that maybe that'll be what the future of mining is what do you think of that adam uh, well, I think they already have that. I mean, there's the cloud hashing ever, right? out there. Yeah, I mean, there there are some projects out there. I don't know. I mean, you think it's, it's crazy? It's really, I don't think it's crazy. I think it's, I think that until we get to the end game, this is an arms race that yeah. normal people should not participate in. You know, while we were while we were at this <laughs> oh, event, <yeah. laughs> I think it's probably right. I have to agree though. Yeah. Well, and I'm out. I mean, there. You know, it's, yeah. I mean, I, I pre-ordered a thing. Uh, I pre-ordered a. Uh, uh, what's it called? A Butterfly Labs, you know, jalapeno. But I got my money back in January because I was like, this is insane. I can't predict what the price is going to be. So I have no idea, right. you know, what's going to happen. I mean, that's it's it's a crazy thing. And, you know, it's so much it's made so much worse by the fact that that we've gone down this pre-order path, right? We've gone down this crowdfunding path. And it would make sense if we were not talking about a, a commodity that floats based on sentiment. Mm -hmm. But when you have a commodity, you know, it's like I bought a camera and a bunch of lenses in November for like 60 Bitcoins. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. at the time I was like, this is a great deal. But now I'm like, okay, that was the most expensive cheap yeah. camera I've yeah. ever bought. You know yeah. I mean? Yep, yep. did so, the same thing with a Note too. I, absolutely. It just, it, so, so, if, the, if nothing else, these continued painful experiences of making a decision and then as time goes on, you're shown just how wrong you were. For me, at least, has been very humbling. And I really try, you know, I, I also spend Bitcoin. Uh, like you were saying uh, earlier in the show, you know, I also spend Bitcoin to pay for things that we need. And, you know, we, we compensated Stephanie for her travel expenses entirely in Bitcoin. And it's a great experience spending it. But at the same time, I would rather spend dollars in nearly every transaction simply because I don't have that, okay, well, I'm spending this now and then later I'm stupid. Right. We're you know? going to call it the pizza effect, really, because everybody knows the story of the, right. of the pizza. And I think... There is some of that, and I, I kind of feel like some of that is – this is going to – this is how you know I've been dr drinking way too much of the Kool-Aid. Some of it I almost take as a sacrifice just to help the currency grow, which is horrible. Well, I mean, that's what it is. Yeah, I'm not a it's sacrifice. Really, it's, I mean, it's, expensive, it's an expensive sacrifice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but but again, I, I don't know. I think that 
though with something like that where something has no value, it's it's uh, easier to make those transactions. And again, the question is, what is your goal? Is your goal for the com- for the you know currency or commodity to succeed in the long term, or is it to maximize your own return? I mean, right, certainly yeah. for me, it's not to maximize my own return. Yeah, Every step right. I take is not about that. You know, it's about it's about continuing to help people see why this is important. Um, you know, stuff like that. Uh, one of the other things about ASICs is I feel like they've been sort of disingenuously uh, marketed because mm-hmm. people, you know, people have the, this idea that, oh, it's an ASIC. It's a dedicated device. Mining is all it does. So therefore, they get it in their head. And certainly I had it in my head that, you, you know, you plug it into the wall, you plug it into your computer and bam, there you go. It's, it's like this thing that's done. But most of especially the high performance and bleeding edge stuff is not like that at all. It's actually quite technical. It requires you to absolutely know what you're doing. And and it's it's difficult. I was talking with Josh from uh, from BFL while we were at this event, mm-hmm. and he said that they get orders from people who are just like uh, uh, who call up and say, "I want three of your most recent thing," and then they get the thing, and you know they're like, "What do I do with this?" And they have no idea, you know, even what they're looking at because again, they're expecting this sort of plug and play thing, right. and it just it doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't know. Yeah, it's not. It's definitely it's definitely very technical still. You know, you got to be com- comfortable with the command prompt. And installing device drivers, and it it's one of those things that uh, back uh, back uh, when I first started mining Bitcoin, it was very much where it feels like Litecoin is at right now. And when I came back to Bitcoin after not mining for a long time, I was actually I had noticed there has been a significant progression in those applications. But as the technology hardware changes, like the the, the client side stuff has to catch up. And and wouldn't it be amazing like this? You know, if there was like a Butterfly Labs fork of Armory or something that had built in support for their hardware and you'd plug it in the USB device and the the Butterfly Labs Armory application would automatically detect all of the settings in the unit and show you a picture of the unit, you know, and and then configure it. I mean, that could be something they could eventually write and configure. It's just they got to do it. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's just a question of, you know, throwing time at it. And as long as the technology is progressing as fast as it is, it's very difficult to justify those type of expenditures. Yeah. Now, now that, that being said, at the same time, these companies are pulling in so much capital that they're getting in advance from their customers before the customers ever see the, you know, ever see any of the technology that I think you could make the case they should be doing it anyway. Uh, that's a good point. Yeah, it's sort of a, yeah, I mean, they especially in the case of Butterfly Labs. Yeah, especially in the case of Butterfly Labs. Well, I mentioned uh, Litecoin just a moment ago. Uh, I, CoinLab, a company that's been in our in our uh, show more and more these days, uh, had had a couple of announcements this week. The one I want to talk about first is they've brought on Charlie Lee, uh, the creator of Litecoin, and he, uh, of course, I mean Charlie has a very distinguished resume. He's worked on Google and, and he's worked on Google Play Games. He's worked on Chrome OS. He's been involved with the YouTube team. Uh, he even was involved with some speech recognition over at Google. Uh, creator of Litecoin, and now he'll be working at Coinbase. So that's going to be an, that's a really interesting purchase on their part. Obviously, a very talented developer, uh, and uh, along with this, Coinbase also announced uh, their take on enabling microtransactions with bitcoins. Now, it does have a catch. Everybody's got to be on the Coinbase system, but what they've done is they've taken the very small transactions off the blockchain and they keep it all within their local SQL databases. So when you have a, when you have a one Coinbase. Uh, customer making another Coinbase customer, they can do these really small microtransactions without the worry of the miners' fees because they're never going to the blockchain. They're just going between accounts, and then after a certain amount, you can then publish that to the blockchain, sort of like you do when you do a regular transaction on Coinbase. Uh, so they're kind of Coinbase is they've taken funding. They've recently enabled instant buy, which people are loving. I am one of them. Um, and now they're bringing on some really talented backend workers and enabling some new concepts for micropayments, uh, which Bitcoin could be fantastic at. Uh, I'll go to you, Drew. Uh, any thoughts on um, if uh, Charlie Lee's over at Coinbase? Do you think are you a little worried maybe he won't be uh, too focused on Litecoin anymore? Uh, no, I, I don't really have a concern about that. I mean, w- with Litecoin in particular. So uh, you know, it, it, does he is he really like maintaining this still? To is he like a leader within the within that group? I'm not quite sure. Adam, you've talked to him, right? Yeah, uh, and we're actually talking with Warren, uh, who's another developer there. They're getting ready to roll out a pretty substantial uh, set of improvements over the next couple of weeks. I'm not exactly sure what the timeline is on that. Um, You know, uh, the concern that I have whenever we start talking about these uh, mainline developers getting hired by other companies that are existing in the space Mm -hmm. is – 
you know, there's there's an inherent conflict of interest there, I feel like. Mm-hmm. You know, it's I had the same concern with Jeff Garzik was hired by, I believe it was BitPay. It might have been BitInstant. I don't, I don't recall. Right. Yeah. Um, and actually, uh, Jonathan Warren, the creator of BitMessage, was just hired by BitInstant, too. Wow. Um, you know, there's going to be a talent grab at some point. And my seems concern like it started is, a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it does seem it seems like we're at the very beginning stages of it, but I think it's yeah. going to it's going to get to be big. Uh, but, you know, it's uh, it, it just I, I don't like it. I, I'm, I'm I unhappy it about that. It depends on what the company's policy is. Like, for example, BitMessage, my audience is in love with BitMessage. I've gotten I've, I've been running it for a couple of months. I've gotten over 2000 bit messages um, <laughs> and it just it just comes in like a flood every time I open yeah. it. I mean, it's people are clamoring. And, you know, I'm hearing from a lot of people outside the U.S. who are bothered by U.S. monitoring. And they, do, they, don't, they, don't, they don't even want to tell me anything private. They just want to be able to send me a message without being watched. And I would hate to see a project like that suffer. But I reflect often on this show on the Linux community. I mean, look at it with the, with the exception of Linus Torvalds, who works for the Linux Foundation, uh, kind of like Gavin. Uh, I, I think a lot of these developers, they work for Red Hat, they work for Novell, they work for IBM, they work for Intel, Microsoft even. A lot of these really important open source developers, uh, even for BSDs and all of them, are working at commercial companies who have some skin in the game in some capacity or another. Now, what's kind of nice is when those skin in the game interests line up. Like you got a kernel guy who loves to work on storage subsystems. Well, yeah, he's going to go work for EMC and that's going to be a wonderful match. You got to wonder when you have the the developer of Litecoin going to work for Coinbase, eh, maybe Litecoin will get a little less attention now. You know, my primary concern with all of it is less about that and more that we're entering a time when, you know, we're entering a time when, uh, I think you're going to go and competitively lock down that talent. No, it's not. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this. Uh, there are going to be changes coming, um, to the various uh, portions of the Bitcoin protocol mm. and there are choices that need to be made. Uh, this is not just about Bitcoin, but Bitcoin is the first one in the line of fire as far as this is concerned. There's a big push. At this conference we went to, there is a very, very big focus on becoming more compliant uh, so that businesses can have an easier time of integrating and enabling with existing systems like the banking system. Yeah. Um, that's really dangerous. And uh, as an example of that, uh, on October 28th of this year, um, the second part of Dodd-Frank, the, uh, the U.S. set of rules um, on financial regulation, goes into effect uh, on the consumer side. In fact, effectively, one of the things that it requires is that all money transmitters have a 30-minute, uh, essentially, refund window. So that after you've placed your, after you've placed your order at Coinbase or wherever you want to go, they have to guarantee the rate and offer a full refund 30 minutes later. So that creates a weird situation where in a normal in a normal environment it'd be fine uh, because you know you you can guarantee that you can have chargebacks and it's easy to rec- recover it at the same rate. But with a system like Bitcoin, what you wind up with is one where you uh, where where there's an incentive now for people to game the system for people to say, okay, well I'm going to place this order and if the price goes up, then I'm going to do it and then I can I have the ability to sell it, turn around, right, do it right there. Or if it goes against me, I can just cancel the order. And so it's a uh, heads I win, tails I don't. I don't even get to yeah, play. Yeah, right. So these are things. This is not the only one. This is one of the major ones. Uh, if you if you take the perspective that compliance because it has to be legitimate is important above all other things, then it's easy to make the argument that we should just change Bitcoin to accommodate this. this is, and I think that this is what we kind of touched on this last week. Is it seems like we could be leading ourselves down a path where we regret we give up some of the fundamentals of Bitcoin. And honestly, what I'm concerned about, I think maybe this is what you're trying to get to, is the people who are in the positions to make these choices are not necessarily making the choices that are in the best interest of Bitcoin, but in the best interest of their pocketbooks. Well, and even beyond that, I think it's more that they don't understand. You know, the skill set that's required to be a good coder and a good implementation person, as far as the Bitcoin protocol is concerned, are not the same skill sets that you want from an economist or you want from someone who can look at look at the true value of this currency and say, yes, these are the things about it that's important. These right. are the things that we should be saving. Yeah. Instead, it's 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 reversed. You know, you take it from it's like the person digging the ditch as opposed to the person designing the canal. You know, I mean, one of them should not should be making the certain decisions. One of them should be implementing certain decisions. This is not to say developers or ditch diggers. It's just to, to say that the skill sets are fundamentally different. And no matter how much you might want to make them the same, they're not. And so if we leave the, the decision making up to people who are good at implementation, but not necessarily good at the bigger picture stuff on this, then that's a bad outcome for everybody. Mm-hmm. And we all suffer because of it. It's interesting. And so I can see how these uh, these these. 
these hirings, these acquisitions or whatever you want to call them of, of talent uh, could end up playing a role in this, especially as people sort of form alliances and, and, and work together as businesses. They might right. move things in a certain direction. And I, I also, you got to look at it. It's also the symptom of a growing successful new economy where you have people who are in important roles in that foundation. They, they should become in demand talent. That's a sign that we're going in the right direction, that they're becoming, you know, these, these, these people that they want to go after and maybe offer special, uh, you know, sign on bonuses for, I mean, how long until we hear a story about some, somebody coming on with some special perk for it? You got to think that this, in some regards, you got to look at it from that angle and say, okay, it's kind of a good thing too. Good for the developers for one good sign for the Bitcoin ecosystem that it's growing, but potentially alarming in another way. And I guess I don't know really where, really where it leaves us. I think what we need to do is we need to differentiate between the types of leaders that we have. We need to have thought leaders who are who can look at this from a big picture perspective and help the community to to come together and see that this is the way forward in a given thing, even if they don't have the ability to implement. And then we need people who are on the implementation side who are able to take that vision and convert it into workable code that is efficient and functional and doesn't break things because that <laughs> also is a hard skill set to yeah. acquire. So, yeah. but I mean, but right now we treat them both as the same thing and they're not good point it's a good point and uh you know i think we're we're all in the very early stages right now where some of it's beginning to happen we don't even realize it's actually happening because it's going to happen behind closed doors in a lot of cases and that's the problem too of course is that there's is that the the there's such a diverse set of skills that are required to even really appreciate what Bitcoin is and what it can be. You know, you need to have the technical side, you need to have the economic side, you need to have the cultural side, you need to have the modern events or the current events side, because all of those things come into play in a pretty major way. Yeah. You, you know, I mean, very few people have that. So even from a like educated audience perspective, it's really, really difficult to have people actually understand what's going on more often than not, especially you know, on the internet, you get this kind of knee jerk circle thing where somebody gets upset about something. And then because they're upset about it, whether or not it's worth being upset about, this is like what the, 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 the dust conversation that we had, you know, the change that they made, this was the Bitcoin dust, maybe two months ago now, um, where they're not allowing certain transactions below a certain size, right? You know, the way that they explained it was terrible. It was awful. And so people freaked out even though that actually wasn't a bad change. It's it's an interim step, but the way that they explained it made it seem like they were just getting rid of microtransactions, you yeah, know, ad, yeah. ad nauseum. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, so long as we have that problem, it's really difficult to even see what's going on. And so what happens more often than not, and what I really hope isn't going to happen with point nine when it comes out later this year, is that they're just going to do it. And, you know, it'll happen and people will get upset about it, but it'll be after the fact and when it's too late to matter. Uh, any thoughts on uh, Coinbase giving a go at enabling micropayments by using their own sort of off-the-chain system just within their own database? Any thoughts on that? There are a bunch of different uh, groups that are doing something like this. I think Coinbase is the first to to come out with it, and I'm excited to see it because, yeah, I think that there's definitely a lot of potential there. What you do with that is you centralize risk, right? Mm -hmm. Because if Coinbase goes away, all those transactions that just exist in their database, well, they're going away too. So there's always going to be this balance between convenience versus overall security. Right. And, you know, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to that. I think it's good that we're pushing in this direction because I can tell you as someone who gets a lot of microtransactions, it actually is an enormous pain in the butt to try to spend them. I literally cannot spend Bitcoin sometimes because it, you know, and when I do, uh, okay, so the way this works is if you get a whole bunch of small transactions and you try to send a large transaction, it has to take all of those small transactions and pile them into one thing, send that to one address, mm -hmm. and then from there it sends to another address. <laughs> so even if the amount is relatively small, the fee winds up being enormous. I right. sent uh, two, to, two Bitcoins this morning, and I think the fee that I had to, to send was 0 0.02 BTC, oh. which is enormous. I mean, enormous. Orders of magnitude greater than the standard fee. Yeah. Yeah, this so their their idea of keeping it all off the off the blockchain there, and then you you don't you don't move it onto there where there be any fees until you've sort of accumulated a certain amount. Uh, you know, I think roughly a dollar is when they'll let you. I don't actually know what I didn't I didn't read that part of it, but I think it's I think Drew, you and I we talk a lot about Coinbase. It seems to be like when you when you read the subreddits out there, Coinbase is becoming one of the darling companies. Drew, do you have any reservations? Are you you purchased your bitcoins there? We just recommended them earlier I, in the show? I like the idea and it introduces some competition to, you know, so people can figure out which is the best, you know, method for, for sending money and receiving money. So, I mean, you can go through the blockchain or you can go to Coinbase. I think having that competition, having that option 
is going to be beneficial because yeah. e- each 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 function is going to serve you know a certain specific need, and just having more options available to people to do these microtransactions, like you're talking about, like the problems that that Adam has with uh, a bunch of uh, tiny inputs. Uh, I think it's good. I, I think it's a good idea to have that um, system. Well, we'll see so, where we'll see where they go with it. <clears throat> Very good. Okay. Earlier well, in the sh- uh, hang on, Chris, I, I, I do want to say something. Earlier in the show, you you uh, had a listener write in about having addresses that expire, and I actually think I can shed some light on this because I just learned about it myself. Uh, so, like I mentioned when we were talking about the content monetization portion, you the system that I'm designing has uh, has this idea of one address per use per user. Okay. So the problem with that is that if you have a lot of users, you generate an enormous number of addresses, which is the same thing that happens at these exchanges. You have your own deposit address, and so they expire those, I think it was after a week. The yeah. reason why they do that is because until they expire it, they literally are checking on a minute-by-minute or second-by-second basis every single one of those addresses. Ah, to see if it's so, received a payment. Exactly. So now this is this is where I, I uh, did not understand. I thought that there was a system somewhere built into the Bitcoin daemon that would make it so that when a payment comes in, it can take response in action to that payment coming in and like, you know, ping somewhere or something right, like that. Yeah. Apparently that doesn't exist. Okay. Apparently any address that you have has to be manually checked, not by a person, but you have to have like a script that goes through and is checking them constantly. I so can see that could be that, a huge drain a after a while. Yeah. So they, they expire them that way. They, they limit the list of what they're constantly checking. Exactly, exactly. Because otherwise, it does become a computational problem, especially if you're dealing with a whole lot of addresses. We're going to have to do the same thing with our system. It's probably, again, going to be like after a week, but it might be after a day because, again, we're going to be generating sometimes 14, 20 addresses on a per-person basis. Hmm. That might just be something people just kind of have to come to expect in some cases until there's some other approach to it. Right. Interesting. Well, Adam, uh, I think that'll bring us to the end of this week's show. Thank you for joining us. Great, uh, great uh, having you on, and I really look forward to seeing where you guys take this platform. I'll be tuning in and kind of keeping tabs on it because you know this is something I'd love to see solved. Well, I appreciate the invitation as always, and keep the great work, Chris and Drew. Where should uh, where should people find your work, and where do you want people to check out all the stuff you're doing? Uh, you can go to letstalkbitcoin.com. Uh, that is the kind of hub for the stuff that I'm doing. Like I said, next week we'll be launching the brand new site, and that'll have a lot more interesting stuff on it. Right now it's primarily the show. Um, and uh, yeah, if you want to email me uh, about anything, really, adam at letstalkbitcoin.com. I'm always looking for collaborators, and I'm always looking for perspective. Right on, sir. Well, great luck, great, uh, great, luck, great work, and good luck on the relaunch. I'll check it out <laughs> next week. All right, Adam, have a good one. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. All right. So, Drew, I saw some people were trying to call in earlier in the show, but uh, they were having troubles getting in. I don't know if maybe now the line's cleared, but before we run, so chat room, this is your last chance to call in before we go. Uh, you can just Skype us, Jupiter Broadcasting. But as we as we wrap, uh, I want to just give out our Bitcoin pick this week. Uh, we, every week, we try to give you a little something to make your Bitcoin life a little easier. Holy smokes. All oh. right. Nick's our first caller. Hey, Nick, you're on, you're on with uh, Drew and Chris. What's going on? Hi. Not much. Not much is going on. So what's on your mind, sir? Oh, uh, there are a couple of things, uh, just brief stuff. I was thinking that what with all the recent concerns for privacy and security and things like that, that uh, it might actually be, I guess serendipitous might be the word, that Bitcoin is around because just like banks need to have vaults and things to keep their stuff safe from, say, robberies, probably things like Coinbase are going to up the ante for security needed on the web. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's yeah, kind absolutely. Of- yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I think about, uh, I think about the potential that uh, we have for, um, you know, maybe not so much Bitcoin with the computational power, but Litecoin and malware abuse and all of these kinds of things. And then when you get into the actual storage of people's money, I mean, it is at a whole level that uh, yeah. that, that the community hasn't really had to deal with yet. You're right. You're absolutely right. Yeah, I think once people have money on the line, it's it's really going to stop this whole... I, I don't exactly know where this fact came from, but I read somewhere that the average company gets hacked like 18 times a year and they don't know about it or they don't report it or things like that. I think that with people actually holding on to money or worse, maybe having addresses that could be compromised in some way like their own money, not just yours, uh, I think people will, you know, like I say, start upping the ante and start actually trying to lock their things down because we do know that a lot of security and privacy issues out there in the world right now are mostly due to ignorance and negligence. I mean, there right. are the obvious compromises on things we think are bulletproof, like there was a Tor compromise and stuff like that. But a lot of it is just like, oh, I didn't bother to set up anything. So. Right. Yeah, that's definitely been the case so far. Well, good thoughts. And definitely something I think we'll be watching evolve on this show is 
as that gets more serious, you know, you see companies that are now offer like offline storage and things like that. I think we'll just kind of, that's it. I think something this show in particular, we're going to try to keep an eye on is the security aspect of a lot of this stuff. So I got your vibe, Nick. Thanks for calling. Yeah. In. There's one other thing I was thinking of too, that may not have been mentioned. Okay. I do think that for people at large to accept Bitcoin, there is going to need to be some sort of buyer protection. I know many things have kind of been thought up, but I'm not sure if anything really tangible has come out of it. When I think of going onto eBay, I think, oh, I can buy this because I'm safe, because if there's something that goes wrong, PayPal has my back, all this stuff like that. There's not really anything built into Bitcoin that protects a buyer from the seller just taking the money and running, is there? Or have I totally missed out on some technology? Well, it would depend, like, uh, so some marketplaces uh, handle this for you, right? So they'll inter- they'll introduce, like, an escrow system where the, you, the, the buyer buys the good and then the seller sends the good. And then once the buyer receives the goods, he releases the funds, right? So there's... A lot, of, a lot of places will introduce a system like that. It just kind of depends on what they want to set up. And the nice thing about that is it actually gives the marketplace um, more insight into the transaction. It gives them more support options. It, it sort of lets them, people might not like this term in this context, but it lets them sort of control that experience a little more from end to end. So it's not necessarily a bad thing that it causes them a little more work. Uh, but there's not like a standardized system, right? You're going to have different people try different things. You'll probably have different companies. It'll be payment gateways that have special provisions and the, you know special competitive uh, features around this kind of these kinds of needs. I think it's more of a market opportunity than it is a deficiency. I, yeah, I do agree with that, that it's definitely an opportunity. But as far as I can see it, I think that there would need to be something kind of like a PayPal, like a leader that really sort of like a coin pushes base. this. Hmm? Sort of like a Coinbase. Yeah, yeah. I guess. Coinbase well, could be doing that. Could yeah. be them, could be somebody else. Yeah. Yeah, it could be anybody right now. I mean, we really don't even mean we don't really even know if Bitcoin's maybe one staying around. So lots of things in flux. Bite your but yeah, those are Nick. those are my basic thoughts. <laughs> Get off of here. <laughs> Hang All, right. On. <laughs> All right, Nick. Thanks for calling in, man. We'll talk to you later. Okay. Have a good All one. Right. All right. So there you go. That uh, <laughs> that was a good ending. You to did. That you call did. Right there. Uh, that, man? So okay, that the line is now open again. Uh, I know, Paul, you tried to call in a minute ago and we missed your call. But uh, all right, did I did I get to my Bitcoin pick? Because it's really cool. Oh, Paul's calling. All right, we'll take Paul's call. Hey there, Paul. Welcome uh, to uh, yeah. Plan B. <laughs> Hi. All right. Yeah, I was. I uh, I called in like just like two seconds earlier than you were on the show. So that's all right. <laughs> so what's on your mind, man? Um. Oh yeah. Yeah. So actually, um, a couple of things. I originally wanted to call in because of the whole tour mail thing, um, and how there really hasn't been a whole lot of press about it. The only article I've seen the, on uh, it. Tor JavaScript exploit thingy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And um, when they took down the freedom hosting. Um, who was hosting Tormail? Because yeah. you know, so many people use Tormail. Um, that it kind of threw a whole lot of things off, at least on the Tor network. I use Tor for a lot of things, so it definitely affected me. Oh yeah. Um, like but, uh, like you were having troubles reaching sites, that kind of thing. Well, like uh, one of the, when they took down Freedom Hosting, because everybody knows Freedom Hosting was kind of renowned for having like the child porn and all that other stuff on it. They just let anything but, go, yeah. Yeah, but they um. They also had uh, Tor Mail on there. Uh, they were hosting Tor Mail, and that's why nobody's been able to access Tor Mail for the last week. Um, so that's a lot of emails gone. Uh, and it, I mean, it definitely affected me and a lot of other people that use it. But, um, so what do you think? Has, do you think, like, uh, have you checked out BitMessage? Yeah, actually, I, I really like BitMessage, yeah. but, uh, uh, it's it's more of one of those things that I'm just surprised that there hasn't been more press about it. The only yeah. article I've seen on it has been on uh, Bitcoin Magazine. And when did it start know, happening? I think it was on the fourth. That well, you know, it was actually realized that uh, freedom. I think it was on the third that it went down. And it, sometimes and then, the, uh, the news just misses stuff when it happens on on a Sunday like that. But yeah, it is kind of yeah. interesting. And I think part of it is it's been wrapped up in with the whole wiretapping, feds, everything else. It's all kind of been swooped up in that whole meta story there. Pretty much. But then, even better, as the show is going on, um, I like to sit on the troll box on uh, BTCE, and they added a whole bunch of pairs for Litecoin, Namecoin, and Novacoin. Um, So you can actually trade Namecoin for US dollars now. Wow. That's pretty cool. BTCE, for some reason, gives me a really weird vibe, but yet they are really are at the forefront of all these different cryptocurrencies. But for something about them, I just don't <laughs> trust. Yeah, no, it's it's true. I, there used to be a lot of complaints about uh, people losing coins and thinking that they were stolen by the guys that were running it. Maybe that's what. It, maybe it's just all the stories I saw about that. Yeah, there's there's a lot of stories on you know through the through the last few years anyway. But then they started uh, doing the 
the, what were they, the email notification verification thing. So whenever you do like anything, you get when an you email about in, it. Go, hey, you logged in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which is great. I actually really like that. And I almost feel like it's more secure than my, uh, my blockchain uh, that I use since I have an iPhone. And, you know, we're kind of limited on the apps, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a whole nother problem, isn't it? Um, well, so what are you going to do about the Tor situation? Uh, honestly, I have no idea. I figure that somebody else is probably going to step up for an email. If anybody really wanted to, now would be a great time to step up with a new uh, Tor mail alternative I think, on I think Tor. it's called BitMessage. I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I really... Because <laughs> I, I think the problem, the problem with email is that it's... It's fundamentally easy to snoop on and shut down because it's centralized and it's the the protocol is based on even encrypted. It's still, you know, it's very easy for them to wrap their brains around. I don't know. Well, I think the only the only problem with BitMessage anyway is that you can't check it from your phone. Yeah, it's not that I'm aware of. Well, so. uh, there's actually somebody. It was sent to me via BitMessage who's working on a web front end BitMessage client, so it logs in and checks your BitMessage and then renders them in an HTML5 web app, and then oh, you could be- you could use that on mobile. So there work. There's people working on it. You know, that's the great thing about it being open source. Is there's, uh, there's a. So I don't know how far along it is, but I saw screenshots of it. it's up on GitHub. So you never know. Might yeah. see it soon. All right, Paul. We'll have a great one. Thanks for calling in. Thanks. Bye bye. All right, Drew. Now I will get to that. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Like it's like the ultimate. It's not. It's. I wish. I almost now. I wish it was almost even more epic than it is. But I have been. It's one of the things I've been crowing a lot about. Mostly on the pre-show. By the way, uh, Plan B is live. Tuesdays, 2 p.m. Pacific over at jblive.tv or jblive.info for the audio. Um, oh, we got another call. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. Hello, undisclosed caller. Welcome to the Plan B Show. Who are we talking to? Oh, hello. This is Michael from Australia. Hello, Michael. Thanks for calling in from Australia. What's on your mind? Uh, I was just, uh, I think Adam mentioned before um, that, uh, you know, flipping a coin on whether to go ahead with the ca- a transaction, but obviously as it becomes more used as a currency and less as a speculative thing, the price should stabilize, right? Yeah, um, theoretically. Uh, yeah, that's, what sm- that's what smart people tell me. Yeah, that's well, hopefully they'll go ahead. I'm in, the, I'm in the same boat as you. I've got a BFL on order. I ordered it maybe five months ago. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can't see it coming within the next year or two. And... Uh, so, I mean, I, I think it would have to come with. I mean, it'd have to probably arrive now in order for you to ever make that money back in a year or two. I think. Yeah. Yeah. For yeah. sure. Yeah. Are you gonna? You know, I, I saw a thread recently. There is a way to get your money back and cancel it. Oh yeah, that looked like a great time, didn't it? I didn't oh, follow through. Is it? Is it monstrous? Oh, he had to go to PayPal, then he had to go back to BFL, then they they went together, then BFL said they'll call him, oh. and then the guy said uh, they never called him, so he went back to PayPal, and then then they got back with BFL. So you get you get an idea of how uh, around how about it is to get your money back. Yeah, <laughs> I'm so, I was I, I, we should ask uh, Adam how he got his money back that quickly. Well, if you pull the trigger fast enough, you can just use the built-in PayPal mechanisms to to cancel it. Right, right, because you do have a certain period yeah. of time. This yeah. this guy was beyond that period of time where right. he could he right, get rid which of is where I'm at now suits. too. Yeah, yeah. Well, huh. all right. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Um. So a, a few episodes ago, you guys mentioned a, a clip from Jeff Berwick. Um. I can't remember specifically what he was talking about when you when you played it, but I went and checked out all his stuff, and he's um, he's sort of an anarchist, um, and you know, general motto is government can never help anything. Um, but I'm interested in getting your guys' opinions on whether you know you sort of believe in an overall because you know it seems like um, government deregulation is really what caused the the financial collapse. Um, Right. And, uh, you know, do you, do you feel um, that, you know, the, do you feel that you're like in a corporatocracy or, um, um, or do you, so do you I, want to see more government, government regulation overall? I see what you're asking. Drew, what do you think? I'll let you take it first. <laughs> Should I go on the record and say that I am also an anarchist? Uh, yeah, okay. All right. Okay. I, I don't. I don't believe that any group of people has a legitimate authority to initiate initiate the use of force against other people. So, um, I, I don't quite buy the argument that deregulation is what caused the uh, uh, the finan- the recent financial crisis. I think there's a lot of stuff out there that's not quite in the mainstream that indicates at least at least if you look at um, like in 
I, I would be pretty confident that it's true that if you look at the total number of pages for regulations that uh, we probably have had a continual increase across time. So if you're looking at the number of regulations that currently exist uh, or that you know were created in that period of time or before the financial crisis, during it, and after, I think that number is continuously increasing. I think it's hard to say it's it's hard to say it's regulation or it's not regulation because it can be specific things about regulation. Like, for example, if there's a if there's regulation saying you banks can't take your general consumer consumer money and use it in the derivative market, and then you remove that 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 artificial regulation that wall, you remove that now. Now they can take they can take everybody's money and play with it on this completely speculative market. They can blow up this huge bubble and then and then it pops and. You see, the problem is, is that you have the reality of our current situation versus what we would like to see. And the reality of our current situation is the two systems. We, we live in a fascist society. The two systems are completely intertwined now. You can't really have one without the other. Um, and I, I, and I, I think Bitcoin sort of allows for a reset to let the market sort of decide where are the appropriate levels. And I think right now, right now, we're very focused on integrating with the current system because Maybe some think this is how we can move people over to Bitcoin. Other people think it's how we're going to make money. Um, and I think you kind of you so you kind of have the market trying to decide what regulation is appropriate and what regulation isn't. And I also well, I don't know if I'm confident it's going to play out the way I'd like it to, but I hope that it finds its own natural balance there. What do you think, Drew? I, I don't have a great deal of faith in humans to manage things without bias or you know perfectly <laughs> relative to. Uh, you know, like a distributed system, like we have with with what is called the free market, where you you know you you have a, a great deal of a great number of decisions made by a great number of people that you can't possibly calculate. That's always fluidly moving. I don't quite know how a small group of old white guys can quite manage that in the most efficient and moral way. But um, I mean, people. The, the, my, my perspective is, is people can do whatever they want. They can have they can impose their own, you know regulations to whatever system they have that they enter into voluntarily. The problem I have is is you you. People talk about the social contract and all that stuff. Um, I don't. I don't recall signing anything that said that uh, if I die, you know, a year before social security, you know, none of my family will get any social security money or anything like that, you know, or that you know, if I you know wanted to get it out, if I wanted to invest my own money, I can't do that. I don't quite like that. So I mean, it's not quite related to Bitcoin, but I just don't. I I, I don't see what big, what regulation specifically. I mean, is going to do because there's a great deal of self regulation and market regulation that already occurs. So. I don't know. Yeah, and the protocol has its regulation built into a degree too. I almost wish the technology could just handle it. But I, I'd love to open this question up to the general audience too, and and get people's to get people to send us an email and let us know what they think. I think this is going to be the hot topic for the rest of 2013 for Bitcoin. It's going to be. It's dry, it, but it's the reality of the current stage <laughs> of the of the technology. Yeah, because I mean, we're kind of at a, at a strange point in time where we got to figure out: Are we going to try to comply, as one of our past episodes implied, or are we going to have to? Be com- you know mo- mostly if not completely separate from the system. We might be able to Bitcoin might be able to you know weasel its way into you know being accepted to some degree. But I think that the regulations imposed by the current powers that be would make decisions that would be a detriment to Bitcoin and what you know advantage it, advantages it provides. So it, it, it's going to be an interesting year or two to figure out <laughs> at what point in time the federal government will actually tell us what these rules actually are. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah. All right, undisclosed Nobody, caller from a remote UI version that is unknown. Any other thoughts? Uh, oh, I'm calling from Google Voice. Um, <laughs> Skype says remote oh, UI go. unknown, <laughs> identified unknown. It's it, you're tripping it out. It's I guess it's detected the Googleness in you. Yeah, it was. It, um, yeah. Uh, long live Debian. That's pretty much it. <laughs> okay, right on. Well, thanks for calling in, sir. Is and uh, and enjoy uh, Australia. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, have a good one. <laughs> How about that? We got a call from Australia. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. I should have asked him what time it was. That's tradition when I talk to somebody from Australia. Son of a gun, Drew. I'm getting old and forgetting this kind of <laughs> stuff. All right. Now, before we get out of here, I want to mention Bitcoin Average. It just launched in beta. And this is something that I have felt like we have needed for a while in Bitcoin is let's move away from any specific exchange telling us what the price of anything is. And let's draw an average. Now, I'd like to see this even extended out a few days, but whatevs. So I'll have it linked in the show notes. It's bitcoinaverage.com. Pretty easy to remember. And it does exactly what it thinks it takes, exactly what you would think. It's a resource to bring accurate price to the Bitcoin community. That's their goal is to say, let's take these several exchanges and do a daily weighted average price. So they're factoring all of the current available exchange data. And you can, like, on the site, if you hover over uh, the... uh, 
you can see like if I hover over the U.S. price, it brings up all of the exchanges that it's pulling. Uh, oh, we got another caller, Drew. Holy. All right. All right. That's our last call of the day. Uh, all right, caller, you're on with uh, Drew and Chris on Plan B. What's going on? Who is it? Hey, Chris. Who it's uh, it? Corey. I can't launch you six um, from the chat room. Hey, Corey. Welcome to Plan B. What's on your mind, sir? Um, with the Essex uh, shipping app, some people are saying that mining is going to become more distributed as you can have, you know, the small USBs, which are, you can just plug into your computer and mine, as Drew has, running off his Raspberry Pi. But then some say it's going to become more by major companies with, uh, you know, the expensive Essex with like the 30 grand ones from Butterfly Labs. What's your opinions on that? Oh, so is it going to be... Is it going to be the people's game or the rich's game? Is that your question? Yeah. What do you think, Drew? Uh, that's hard. I, I liked your argument earlier when you were, when we were speaking to Adam about um, you know the of, of the idea of purchasing shares like we already have with ASIC Miner. I just it's 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 so difficult to tell right now. Like, is it are, is hashing power going to continue to just you know increase oh, exponentially yeah. oh, like of course, this? Yeah. And I mean, it's going to be more cost effective for people to centralize. Their, their purchasing of these and the operating of ASICs, or yep. is it going to be better for it to be distributed? That's a tough one. I, I, I have to err that it's probably going to be yep. more efficient to be centralized to some degree. Yep. Oh, of course, just like everything else, right? Just like everything else. I think that's exactly what will happen, and then the average man will play the shares game. I'd love to, yeah, I'd love to buy some shares, but, but you know uh, what? that's a pain in the ass. I don't know if that... I like the idea of the little Butterfly Labs box that can sit on my desk, but you know, when you get into the serious, nitty-gritty Bitcoin mining... It's a dirty job. You can send out Mike Rowe to one of these data centers. I mean, it is hard. It is expensive. There's a s ton of work. It's constant maintenance. I mean, at any actual scale where you to earn profit, you're now at the point where I I think it's beyond what your average home user wants to commit to. It'd be it it literally be easier to you could make more money growing and selling marijuana. <laughs> you know, I suppose mean, you, you could, but yeah. I mean, so if you're gonna if you're gonna spend the time and money, it's probably just as almost as much work, if not as I don't know. I don't know. I've only done Bitcoin mining, but I would assume. Yeah, I suppose yeah. you have not been growing marijuana. But I can tell you, when I had a decent Bitcoin, I only like at my peak had I don't know four, five, maybe six computers going, and I was constantly having to check on them and reboot something, or you know, it was just this game of of. It was one of the reasons why I burnt out on it, and I think. Uh, because this is a technology that is just exploding like a madman, maybe the consumer devices will trickle down to us and we can play around. But when you want to be at that cutting edge, I think you got to go pro. And then when you talk about, you know, somebody coming in and writing a $200 million check in the future, potentially, or maybe a $100 million check or even a $75 million check, there's no way average consumers can compete at that level. Yeah, yeah we'll be completely shut out of that. Uh, shut out, out of that. Yeah. And I suppose, you know, as you were saying with centralization, it's just what's happened with normal mining now, you know, with pools. So as right, Essex, yeah. you know, ship in at a, an alarming rate now, I suppose that we're going to have it being just share game because, you know, if you want to keep up with it, you need a massive hash rate, which needs, means you need a massive amount of money. And to get that funding, you're getting the shares and, you know. Right. Kind That's of a good point. Yeah, like, like we're, we're we're kind of seeing the first step of that centralization with Bitcoin, with uh, with pooled mining, and then maybe the next step is like we see with ASIC miner purchasing shares from a couple institutions. Who, you, you, you know, know what my first thought was when I saw that saw that story when it when it looked legit about them getting two hundred million dollar investment. I thought, damn, I should have bought shares. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would have been a uh, yeah. So you know, I mean, I think that I think that's already shown us that's probably the way forward. I think that was sort of the indication that if people had if people had some Bitcoin to spare and wanted to play, yeah, it might be not a bad way to play. Yeah, and uh, the early um, investors in Essex Mine are probably pretty happy right now. Too. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, yeah, I saw some early numbers. It was it was a couple million. If you put drop to like a thousand into it in the very beginning, you're looking at a couple million profit right now. Oh, I wish I was there. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't believe uh, it. Yeah, I wish I was there too. It is so hard to tell, especially when they're group buys and there's that you know it starts in a form thread and you don't know. Yeah, who's... You see something on Reddit. It's like yeah, we're we're all going to be uh, you know going in on on buying yeah. some hardware. Yeah. And you're like oh, I don't know about that. Yeah, it's yeah, I, 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 I always see those. I'm like, mm, should I? Yeah, exactly. Because because you can't predict the network. You can't predict what's going to happen to it. You right, know? right. You don't know what's going to happen. You, you know, today uh, today the price is holding above $100. Uh, in seven days, when we're doing episode 19, I have no idea what that price is going to be. I think I think it's actually yeah. going to stick around where it's at. Uh, I think we're seeing a healthy floor develop. But, you know, who knows for sure, right? Something could happen. Something big could happen, and then it, it could take a dive. You just never know. Exactly. All right, caller. Well, uh, any other uh, thoughts? 
Uh, not really. Although I will say I'm from Australia too. So, you know. Okay. What, okay. Let me ask you, what time is it at where you're at? Um, where I'm at, it's six nineteen in the morning, but you know, I'm on the West side. Oh, so I, over there I'm, and on the other side, it's what? Eight nine ten. What are you doing? What are you doing? Listening to Jupiter broadcasting at 6am. Do you get up super early? I'm dedicated. <laughs> wow. Good man. <laughs> yeah. I, I was up, uh, I was in the IRC at like, 445 so well i'm glad we took your call because you're the last caller today so i'm glad we got you on the show all right well thanks for uh, waking up early to chat with us (laughs) okay all right have a great rest of your day go get some coffee now okay all right (laughs) okay Okay. bye (laughs) i feel bad for that guy because hurry up you gotta make your pick hold on go go, go. and all right so there you go okay there you go i've no i've signed out of skype i'm done i'm i'm calling it i think that was a good call to end on so go over to bitcoinaverage.com they've got They've got uh, all the different all the different currencies. It's not just USD, although that is at the top, but you can switch it. They've got an open API, so you can pull this into your own applications. And this is a weighted average price from all the different exchanges. And when you mouse over a price, you see all the exchanges that it's pulling from and their current real-time price. I think it's really clean, really nice. And if you're somebody who just wants to get an idea of how Bitcoin's doing and you don't want to obsess over it, I think BitcoinAverage.com is the way to go. Yes, sir. There you go. That's the Bitcoin pick of the week. All right, folks. Well, we're going to wrap it up right there. Thanks to uh, Adam from Let's Talk Bitcoin for joining us. And thanks to all you guys who called in. That was really great to hear from you guys. I want to do that again in the future, Drew. Maybe in another week or two, we'll do another uh, call in. And thanks to Albert on the uh, G Plus uh, community for uh, setting up an event. Don't forget, Plan B is live on Tuesdays, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. GMT over at jblive.tv and jblive.info for the audio version got a subreddit we'd love to get your participation in planbshow.reddit.com you can find links to our g plus profiles in the show notes as well as links to everything we talked about our show music and ways you can support the show to keep us on the air we appreciate it hey drew go cool off now right we're all done i'm about to dive towards the door and open it up all right man have a great week thank you everyone for tuning this week's episode of plan b we'll see you right back here next week